As a boy, were you always adventurous? No, I, I don't quite know why uh, these things happen to me, except that I tend to say yes. Mm. You know, there are lots of people who say no. Uh, there was a time quite recently when a blind man phoned me at 11 o'clock on a Sunday evening and he said, will you be my sighted pilot on a microlite flight to Australia leaving at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning? Mm. And I know that most people would go, no, no chance whatsoever. But uh, I said, I'll think about it. And, mm. um, and I got him as far as Cyprus and I found a man to go and take him on to Australia. And we all three of us had a fantastic adventure. Mm. Now, there are, the, you know, almost the default word for the 21st century is no. Can we do this? No. Can mm. we do that? No. Mm. And I belong, I feel, in a different generation and a different era is to say, well, wouldn't it be nice if we could? And that's what I try and do. Mm. What inspired you to overcome your fear and uh, fly solo by microlight around the world? Well, I had an accident uh, in front of the television cameras. Ten years after I, I drove this car across the Sahara, I was a BBC reporter by then, mm. and, uh, and we were experimenting with hang gliders. I was part of not quite the really early bit. The really early bit is 1971 to 74, mm. um, but I came in in 74, so a lot of experimenting was still going on, and we were sticking engines on hang glider wings, mm. and then somebody was getting killed, and we think, well, it's not there, and we're sticking it somewhere else. Mm. And with me, uh, I wanted to be the first man to fly a microlight or a powered hang glider from London to Paris because mm. uh, that's the great classical aviation journey. Yeah. If you go back into history, before the First World War, the London-Paris route, it was in those magnificent yeah. flying machines, that was about a race from London to Paris. Mm. And, uh, and in those days we stuck an engine above the head of the pilot with a big long shaft sticking out the back and the propeller uh, about two feet away from the pilot's feet and, mm. and you know, if he if he mangled it, you know, he could end up having his, his toes chopped off, which happened mm. to one pilot. Mm. And uh, uh, there were hang gliders, so we, would, we had two throttles. We had a big peg, mouth throttle, and a hand throttle. Mm. And you used to rev up the engine, close your teeth over the mouth throttle, mm. run like a pig, get off, okay, mm. spit out the throttle, mm. open up the hand throttle, and then fly around. Mm. And uh, I was doing this in front of BBC Nationwide cameras one day. Mm. Uh, in, a, in a very ancient bowl, a uh, Saxon Celtic bowl, perhaps in, in Wiltshire. And um, uh, I turned it upside down, folded the wings up and fell 250 feet. And, uh, you know, obviously I live, but if you look at it, you think that bloke's a goner. Mm. Um, but they had ploughed the field the previous day and it had rained overnight and I had so little expectation of staying alive mm. that I didn't brace up. So that was what caused my fears. I got back into hang gliding in 13 weeks, I think. Mm. But I couldn't fly with an engine for six years because mm. I was so frightened. And when I did fly with an engine, I would get recurrence of these fears. Mm. And uh, I felt myself that these fears were cowardly. And I didn't, I, you know, I was ashamed of them. I didn't feel that this was what a man should, he shouldn't have his, his life circumscribed like that. Mm. And so when I came to sort of big journeys like flight to Australia and later mm. the flight around the world, I found odd ways of, uh, of getting over those sort of fears, normally mm. involving thoughts of women as it happens. <laughs> Were there any times that you, you felt like giving up? No. You don't, you, I mean, on, when I crashed, uh, I mean there were very amusing moments later. I, I had led a team of hang glider pilots to America and we just thrashed the Americans, which is you know, it's the first time the Americans had come across the British and, you know, they like to caricature us as people with big teeth and, you know, and princey manners and that sort of thing. Mm. And we went in there with t-shirts on saying the British are coming and we just went for them. We weren't nasty about it, but yeah. uh, I remember, you know, saying to my pilots, whatever you do, you do it better than them. So when they come down to breakfast, you've had breakfast and you're on the hill. Mm -hmm. When you're on the hill, you're in the air. Mm -hmm. When they're in the air, you're higher than them. In the mm -hmm. evening when you go out, I want Americans to see you with a girl on each arm and three drinks lined up in front of you. And the following morning, I want you to be down at breakfast before anyone else did. So mm -hmm. that was how aggressive we were. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I crashed, mm -hmm. ten days later, I was due to meet Prince Charles as, mm -hmm. uh, uh, as he was president of the Royal uh, Aeronautical Club, or Aeronautical Society, Royal Aero Club. Mm. And there I was with a big black eye and my arm strapped up and this hand, this whole arm in plaster. 
and I was introduced as the captain of the British Hang Gliding. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, hang gliding is one form of aviation I haven't tried. And I looked back at him and I thought, I'm sure your mum won't let you. On a deeper <laughs> level, I resented the fact that my fears were stopping me having adventures and so uh, I, I overcame those fears. Mm -hmm. uh, once upon a time I couldn't fly without chewing gum. I don't know why, but uh, you know got out and stopped chewing gum immediately, but only when I was in the air I had to chew gum. Mm. And then uh, there was one particular time on the flight to Australia where uh, this thing stood on the nose of my aircraft. I mean, oh. it wasn't real, but it was no. real in my head. Yeah. And it was, I was at 5,000 feet, I was tired, I'd been going for 34 days, I think. And this thing stood on the nose of my aircraft and said, jump, 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 and I was no parachute. You know? mm. And I got within an ace of mm. uh, jumping. Um, mm. And the only way I could get rid of him was to line up pretty girls in my head. And he turned out to be a dirty old man. So, you know, you start to think of pretty girls that you really fancied. And he yeah. stopped shouting, jump, jump, jump. Yeah. So that was, you know, one of the odd ways that I overcame things. Was there a particular pretty girl that you had in there mind? There was a particular pretty girl, and I am never going to identify her. I do remember an Australian reporter said, will you name these girls? And the answer was no. I mean, I'm a gent. <laughs> 